Hi your friends, it's Miss Sarah. Welcome to another round of First Chapter Friday. This week we are reading The Outlaws, Scarlet and Brown, and this is by Jonathan Strahd. So this book is about a girl named Scarlet who does a lot of bank heists and like has a life of crime. And one day she helps this this man named Albert. He, I guess he's the only lone survivor of a crazy tragic accident. So she takes him in and she realizes that this might actually be a mistake because she ends up taking, um, while she's taking him along, she ends up getting uh, chased by a whole bunch of bad guys and a whole bunch of bad things are happening. And she can't figure out why because she only robbed a tiny little bank. So as she's running around with Albert, she, um, they're chasing away other bad guys, they're chasing away horrible beasts, and she realizes that maybe it's not her that these, these bad guys are after, but perhaps it's Albert. So, I'm going to start with the first chapter called The Wild. Part one is called The Wilds. So, that morning with the dawn hanging wet and pale over the marshes, Scarlet McCain woke up beside four dead men. Four. She hadn't realized there had been so many. No wonder she felt stiff. She tipped her prayer mat from its tube and unrolled it on the ground. Sitting cross-legged upon it, she tried to meditate. No luck, not with four corpses staring at her and a knife wound throbbing in her arm. A girl couldn't concentrate in those conditions. What she needed was food and coffee. She got to her feet and glared down at the nearest body. It was a portly, black-bearded Woltzman in a denim shirt and jeans. He looked old enough to be her father. Perhaps it was her father. His face, half resting on mud and stones, wore an aggrieved expression. Yeah, we've all got problems, Scarlet said. You try to rob me, that's what you get. She stepped over the man and went down to the lake to inspect the animal snares. Yet again, her luck was poor. The traps were broken, the new strings bitten through. At the end of a smear of blood, a rabbit's head lay tilted in the bent, wet grass. The long, rust-colored ears were cocked upward, as if giving her a furry two-finger salute. It was like the mud rats had deliberately left it that way. Scarlet McCain wore, swore feelingly in the direction of the forest. Then she took a penny from her pocket and transferred it to the leather cuss box hanging at her neck. Already in the red, and she hadn't even had her breakfast. Back at camp, she brewed coffee over the remains of the night's fire. She drank standing up, straining the dregs through her teeth, and spitting the black grit into the water of the stream. It would be a clear day, cool at first, but no rain. The hilltops of the wood, wolds were picked out of, in buttery yellow, the western flanks still dark and blue. Way off beyond the edge of the marshes, Scarlet could see the street lights of Cheltenham showing behind the fortifications. As she watched, they shut off the town generator and the lights winked out. In another half hour, they'd open the gates and she could go in. She rolled up her blanket and slotted her prayer mat in its tube, then went to collect her soldier sticks. Two had been trampled in the fight, but three were okay. The smell had kept the mud rats off during the night. Scarlet shook her head. It was getting so you couldn't take a kip in case one of those bristly guys slunk out of a bush and bit your nose off. The bigger rats would do that. It happened to people she knew. She stooped to her rucksack, unclipped the two empty bottles, and carried them to the stream. One of the men she killed was lying half in the water, face up, blonde hair swirling with the river weed. A white hand floated above the pebbles like a crimped, crimped and curling starfish. Scarlet went upstream of the obstruction. She didn't want to catch anything. Her leather coat brushed against the reed stalks as she waded a few steps in and refilled the bottles. Mud and water reached halfway up her boots. She glimpsed her pale round face hanging distorted beyond the ripples. Scarlet frowned at it and the face frowned back at her. If long red hair was tangled worse than the river weed, she'd have to fix that before she went to town. She was tightening the bottle's tops when she felt the skin prickle in the back of her neck. She looked behind her, suddenly alert, her senses operating at a new intensity. The sun was rising over the Wessex wilds. Everything was lit a fiery, optimistic gold. There was almost no breeze. Out on the lake, the motionless water clung about the reed stems as flat and blank as glass. Scarlet stood where she was, a bottle in each hand, trying to hollow herself out so that every available sensation came flooding in. Her eyes moved slowly around. No danger was visible, but that didn't fool her. Something had come out of the forest, drawn by the smell of spilled blood. So where would it be? A short distance from the shore, midway between the lake and the trees, the remains of ancient buildings protruded from humped grass. Melted walls were crags now, harder than the rocks 
and fused into the strange black shapes. A flock of birds, coiling like a streamer, wheeled and darted about high above, then swept off across the forest. She could see nothing else, nor was there any sound. Scarlet walked back to her run sack, crux sack, fixed the bottles and tube in place, and hoisted the bags over her shoulders. She kicked soil over the fire, circling slowly so as to scan the landscape in all directions. If time had allowed, she would have rifled the bodies of the outlaws in search of supplies, but now she just wanted to get away. She made a token inspection of the bearded man, just another failed farmer who brought, who thought possessing a knife, a paunch, and a bad attitude made him capable of attacking a lone girl sitting by her campfire. The knife was not as sharp as the one Scarlet had in her belt, but he did have a greaseproof pack of sandwiches in the pocket of his jacket, so that was Scarlet's lunch sorted. She left the camp and began threshing her way through the tall wet grasses. Off to the west, clouds were massing to extraordinary heights, mountains of pink and white towering over the Welsh frontier. Scarlet moved away from the lake and made directly for the creeks. Better to face the creature now out in the open with the sun at her back than be stalked across the marshes. Hide and seek wasn't her thing. When she got within 50 yards of the walls, she stopped and waited. Presently, a long, low-backed piece of darkness peeled off from the edge and loped into the sunlight. It was a brindled gray and black wolf, a mature adult, twice as long as Scarlet was tall. Its head was lowered, but the lazy, lazily swinging shoulder blades rose almost as high as her chest. The amber eyes were fixed upon her. It came forward on hurriedly with the confident swagger of a salesman about to close a deal. No fuss, no fury. It was too keen to get the job done. Scarlet's hand moved slowly toward her belt, otherwise she stood where she was, a slim, slight slim figure in a battered brown coat, weighed down with a rucksack and tube and bottles and all the paraphernalia of a girl who walked the wilds. The wolf slowed its pace. When it was six yards away, it halted. It raised its head to the level of Scarlet's, and she and the animal appraised each other. Scarlet took note of the wet things, the black lips, the intelligence burning in its gaze. Perhaps the wolf noted something in Scarlet McQueen, too. It turned its head all at once, strutting past her and away. Its thick, sharp tang whipped against her face and was gone. Girl and beast separated. The wolf ambled toward the lake, following the scent of the bodies. Scarlet took a comb from a pocket and ran it through the worst knots in her hair. Then she located a piece of bubble gum, tightened the straps in her rucksack, adjusted the hang of her gum belt, and set off toward the distant town. Enough dawdling. Time to get on with business. Time to demonstrate how a robbery should be done. That is the end of chapter one of The Outlaws, Scarlet and Brown. If you'd like to know more about Scarlet's adventures, why she is killing men, and who Brown is, just give us a call in the children's department so we can put it on hold or come visit us. I hope you have a great Friday, friends.